Welcome back to Just Talking. We have a great show today because we have a great guest who's been on the show before, but it's going to be a terrific conversation. It is Dave McGrath. He's the new director of WGTD FM 91.1, but more importantly, he wrote a book and now an author. Uh, Dave, nice to see you today. Thank you, Jason. We haven't seen each other in person for a long time, but we've been friends for a long time. Oh, absolutely. And ever so often when we talk, or you've been on my show, we sort of glaze over the Gene Pitney story. I know you're involved with them, but now we're really going to get in the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, so you wrote a book, Gene Pitney, uh, The Singer, The Songs, The Songwriters. Um, well, maybe for our uh, audience, those who don't know Gene Pitney, Gene Pitney, maybe get a background. Who was Gene, Gene Pitney? Gene Pitney was a pop singer who had a lot of hit records between 1961 and 1967. I describe him as the Frank Sinatra of the uh, baby boomer generation because he had that same type of career. He had hit records. He had screaming female fans. He did sold out tours. And he was just one of a kind, a very unique voice and a very unique singer and just a big, big star for six or seven years in the United States. And then after the hit stop, he continued to tour. So Gene worked, he unfortunately died uh, at a very early age. He died in 2006 at the age of 66. He just died suddenly. And, but up, up, up through that entire time, he was still touring in the United States Australia, England, Italy. So he had a great career and a great life. So the singer, the songwriter and songs, is, was he known more for singing or writing songs? Or, so or Gene, Mr. Ball? Gene came along at a time before there were singer-songwriters. The Beatles really introduced that to music, singer-songwriters. Gene was actually one of the first singer-songwriters because he did write three hit songs before he started having his own hits. He wrote Hello, Mary Lou for Ricky Nelson. Everybody knows that. He wrote Rubber Ball for a guy named Bobby V. And then he wrote He's a Rebel for the Crystals. And then he launched his own career as a singer. And he had humongous hits. Only Love Can Break a Heart, Town Without Pity, The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, Mecca, 24 Hours from Tulsa. I can go on and on and on and on. So more, known more as a singer, but he also has three great songs to his credit as a songwriter. Uh, you brought up The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Now, I've seen the movie, but the song isn't in it. So let's hear the story behind that. So that's one of those, that's one of those stories where I, I always try to relate this as, you know, how eyewitness accounts to an accident always vary from one person to the other. Because <laughs> a lot of it depends on, on your relationship to this song. If you were the songwriter, if you were the performer, if you were the director of the movie, that the song was written for. And that director was, you would know him, John Ford, a legendary Hollywood director. So Hal David and Burt Bacharach were paid a lot of money to write this song for the movie by Paramount Pictures. Gene Pitney was paid a lot of money to record this song. He was paid a lot of money by Paramount Pictures because Gene was just coming off another hit from another movie called Town Without Pity. So they figured, ah, pop star, the kids love him. They already had a hit with one movie theme. Let's have him do another movie theme. So now you got a lot of money invested by Paramount Pictures to the songwriters and the singers. They go to John Ford and John says, I don't want any crummy pop song in my movie with Lee Marvin and Jimmy Stewart. No, it's not going in. And as much as they lobbied for it, as much as they almost begged to have him put it in, he said no. And it never did get in the movie. Uh, Hal David once did an interview. Hal was the guy who wrote the lyrics. Burt Bacharach always wrote the melodies. Hal always wrote the lyrics. Hal went on an interview uh, long, long after the movie came out and was still a, good, a success. He said, I bet you John Ford wishes he had that song in his movie after it went into the top 10 and sold millions of records. It certainly would help the box office gross for the movie as well. But that's the, the real reason it never got in. Now, different people will tell you different things. Again, depending on what their relationship was to the song in the movie. But that's why it was. John Ford said, no, not in my movie. Again, you have so much knowledge of Gene Pitney. Maybe those who don't know, you worked with them or had, uh, let's hear about how you got involved knowing Gene Pitney. So we worked, I say we, Guido, 
my, my wife, Guido Brown, and I worked with Gene from 1985 until he died in 2006. But my relationship goes back to, well, I first became aware of Gene when I was in seventh or eighth grade at a Catholic school in Milwaukee. And Jason, I was not always the dashing, debonair, worldly raconteur that you know now. <laughs> grade school, I was kind of a geek. So uh, one day, uh, the coolest kid at St. Peter and Paul in Milwaukee told me, this is Gene Pitney, he's great. He's great. You should listen to him. So what's a geek like me supposed to do when the coolest kid in school tells me to listen to Gene Pitney? So I did. And you know what? I liked his music. I liked his voice. I liked the songs and everything else. And I just, he grew on me. He has an acquired taste. His voice is an acquired taste, but he grew on me. And I just liked every, you know, every record he made. One was better than the next. And they were just great to listen to on the radio. And, and some of them actually meant something to me as a teenager, because he's saying a lot about lost love and love that never was because, you know, in eighth grade and Jeannie Klingbell across the room where you're madly in love with has no idea who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and Gene Pitney singing only love can break a heart. Well, yes, it can. So uh, it became a fascination. I just started buying his record and collecting his records and I liked them. And at some point, you know, I always wanted to be on the radio. I knew in fifth grade I wanted to be on the radio, but I also wanted to be part of the music business, especially because when I was growing up, the British invasion happened. The Beatles, the Dave Clark Five, the Rolling Stones, Hermits, Hermits, and all those. And I was just, I was just consumed by all that music, and I loved it, and I wanted to be part of it. It took me a number of years and a certain amount of stalking, Mr. Pitney. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we finally hooked up. And actually, in 1983, he had called me one day. Uh, I'm actually putting a new floor in my kitchen. My phone rings. And he said, hey, Dave, this is Gene Pitney. Would you run my fan club? Now, that sounds silly. Fan clubs sound silly. But this is pre-internet days. And even today, stars have fan clubs because they give their fans a better access to good tickets for concerts. But before the internet, stars used them to let fans know about touring dates, when a new record was coming out and when they were gonna be in their city on a show. So he asked me to take that over for him in 83, but I said, I'll do that if you let me sell merchandise at your shows. Because I had just started doing a little bit of merchandising with Sticks, the band from Chicago, mm -hmm. through a friend of mine. And so I thought I knew something about it. <laughs> Gene didn't know how little I knew, <laughs> but he said, fine, you run my fan club. And when I started doing American dates, come and do my shows and we'll sell merchandise. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. He decided to uh, re regenerate his career in America. He never lost his career overseas. He was, he was always a big touring performer in England and Italy and Australia and New Zealand but he wanted to restart his career here. And that's when I came into play. I just happened to be Jason. I was the right guy at the right place at the right time of Gene's career. And he, he took me under his wing. He embraced me and he taught me everything he knew about the music business. And uh, from that, we went on to work with Dion from Dion and the Belmonts, Run Around Sue. We worked with Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits for many years. And I owe all that to Gene. Well, that's the one thing that's really great about you is that, you know, you're great communicating with people. Did it think ever down the line that since you had a great relationship with them, you'd end up being his publicist or manager? So, you know, for a little geeky kid from Milwaukee who listened to Gene Pitney on the radio growing up, you can't have that dream. You, you really can't. And then when it starts to when it starts, when he says, will you work for me? And then the next step is, yeah, you can do my tour merchandise. And then, yeah, Dave, listen, I need you to make sure nothing goes wrong at this show uh, as far as um, press and, and people wanting to meet. Gene was not real comfortable meeting people all the time. Sometimes he had to. In the position he's in, he's asked a lot of times to do what you know what they are, meet and greets. And he would do them, and he was very good at doing them because Gene had a great personality when he wanted to use it. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, he wasn't comfortable with that. And so one of my jobs always was, it was good cop, bad cop. You know, Gene was always a good cop. If somebody had to say no, 
no, you can't do that. No, Gene's not available. No, this isn't going to happen. It had to be me. So at some point, he trusted me enough to be that guy who could do that and do it judiciously. While you can say no, you can also do it in a way where it doesn't hurt somebody's feelings and they understand, oh, yeah, I get it. And then I moved into that position with Gene. And then when we asked Gene to be the best man at our wedding in Kenosha in 1998, he said yes. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. So when Gwyn and I got married in February of 98, Gene was the best man at our wedding. So that's how the, the uh, relationship had switched from simply star and employee. It became more of a personal relationship. And so we would go out to Gene's house. He lives in Summers, lived in Summers, Connecticut. And he'd invite us out there. We'd, we'd be out there. And we still go see his wife, Lynn, on a frequent basis. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends on how you looked at it, uh, I was honored to be a pallbearer at his funeral mm. in 2006. So it was a, a great relation, relationship that began as a business relationship and then developed into a personal relationship. And we got along famously. We really did. How did it come about to uh, write a book on uh, Gene, Gene Pepper? Finally, in 2006, and after working with Gene at that point, 21 years, and asking him day after day after day, let's write an autobiography, let's do an autobiography. Something to sell out on tour and something to sell to fans. Nah, not yet, Dave, not yet, Dave, not yet, Dave. Finally, Jason, this is the oddest situation. Uh, the last time I saw Gene was in February of 2006, Valentine's Day, at a show at a casino in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, called Soaring Eagle, Cas Soaring Eagle Casino. I said, well, we're going to do an autobiography? He said, yeah, now's the time, let's do it. So I started doing interviews with people he had worked with, uh, songwriters and other performers and everything else in February of 2006. In April of 2006, he dies. So at that point, I decide there's no, well, there's no autobiography. I could have done a biography, but I just, I just didn't think the interest would be there. You really need that star to go out and publicize it and then go out and sell it on tour. You know, you need Gene Pitney to go on TV shows like yours or what other, you know, other TV shows you can get on and sell the book. And without Gene in the picture, I decided to put it away. And then about four years ago, it just dawned on me, um, if I can bring more people into the arena to make it a little bit broader appeal, then it dawned on me because Gene came up before the singer-songwriters, and the songs that were written for him were written by the Rolling Stones, Burt Bacharach and Hal David, Carole King, Barry Mann, Cynthia Wilde, all the, the legendary songwriters. Most of them were still alive. Uh, some, of them, some of the other people had passed because when they were writing those songs 60 years ago, they are already 25 years old, so some had passed. But some of the big songwriters are still alive, and they're all very generous with their time and gave me interviews. And I decided that would be the book. The singer, the songs, and the songwriters. You bring all those people in. Because when you write your own songs, like most people do now, there's not a big story about how you got the song. Well, I wrote it. But when you were having other people write the songs, there are fabulous stories how they got their songs to you, how they had to sneak their songs to you or pressure somebody to get you their song or beg, beg a, a star like Gene Pitney to sing their song, you know, catch them in the elevator or wherever they could and, and play them a song. So th those stories became, some were very bizarre, some were fascinating, but, and some were just very, very interesting. And I put together the book with 32 songs, most of his big hits, and then some of the other songs that necessarily weren't hits, but they had great stories behind them. I also like how you put those fun facts in before the chapter. Uh, can, <laughs> can you uh, uh, say a few of them uh, for our viewers? That uh, it kind of entices you to kind of get into the, that chapter. Yeah, the fun facts were pretty much meant to be the hook. Let's grab somebody okay. in. Um, like the biggest hit Gene Pitney ever had in this country was a lovely, gorgeous Burt Bacharach, Hal David ballad called Only Love Can Break a Heart. Went to number two in November 1962. Uh, Burt played in the song. That, that was always how it worked out with Burt and Gene and Hal. Burt would go to the musical or record office and play Gene the song on the piano and sing it for him. They did that and Gene said, I can't do that. There aren't enough words. 
So I went and counted the words. There are 116 words in that song. Now, perspective on that is, the chorus is, only love can break a heart, only love can mend it again. That's 12 songs. It's sung four times in the record. So that's 48 of those 116 words. Uh -huh. <laughs> he said, I, and then what I did, Jason, was I went and found just another song at random. So I pulled up Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. You know the song? Uh -huh. So now 116 total words and only love can break a heart. In the first verse of Born to Run, there are 86 words. So you, you can see Gene had a point. Bert convinced him to record it. He said, I'm telling you, Gene, it's a hit. I am guaranteeing you it's a hit. So now back in the days, back in the early 60s, after the, the star, the singer, recorded the songs, they would go to radio stations, big radio stations, New York, Chicago, and talk to the DJs. Hey, this is my latest song. Will you play it? Gene took that record, Jason. Only Love Can Break a Heart. And he talked to the DJs and said, don't play that. Play the other side. He said, I want you to play the other side, which is called If I Didn't Have a Dime. Fortunately, the DJs didn't listen to him. <laughs> they played Only Love Can Break a Heart. It became a huge hit for him. Ended up at number two in November of 1962. And I'm only emphasizing that because that very same week on the Billboard charts, the number one song was He's a Rebel by the Crystals, written by Gene Pitney. Wow. That's how big he was. In, in those six, seven years that his career was just a gigantic music career. You know, I've said publicly, how you're just such a great news writer and you know how to write perfectly. Why haven't you wrote books besides Gene Pitney? Did, you, did it ever cross your mind that you to write a book on, on something else or anything like that? Because um, I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, Guida, my wife, is a great writer, and I, I dabbled at it at, at happenings, and I do some of the news writing at WGTD. But it's not a process that I really enjoy. You know? yeah. But this was so close to uh, to my heart. This was I just owed Gene so much, and I really wanted a quality book about Gene with my name on it. And so when I started writing this, and all the songwriters were so generous with their time and, and their stories, some of the stories are just the only love to break a heart story is interesting. Some of them are even weirder. Um, it just, uh, the, the words gushed. You know, I'd just be sitting at this computer right here and just slamming the uh, keyboard. Fortunately, my wife is a brilliant proofreader and editor, and she made all my gibberish readable. Well, speaking of Guida, what was really interesting was when she shared or posted a video of you accepting an award for Gene Pitney. Maybe if you can talk about that. I was just stunned. I was just sat by like, yes, uh, Dave should get an award for something, but at the same time, it was really shedding light on, on just how great Gene Pitney was. But maybe if you explain that award show. So, uh, like, as I mentioned before, one of the songs Gene wrote was um, Hello, Mary Lou which was a big, huge hit for Ricky Nelson in 1962-ish. Well, the Statler brothers decided to record it in 19, I want to say 85, I'm not sure. And they did, and they had, they had a huge country hit with it. So there was this magazine or newspaper called the Music City News, and they would put on an award show for best this and best that. And that record by the Statler brothers was nominated that year for the best country song. So Gene calls me. So they, they, they alert Gene. They said, listen, you're nominated. Here's, here's when it's going to happen. Here's when the show is going to take place. If you're interested to come to Nashville, here's all the information. So Gene calls me up and said, hey, you want to go to Nashville? Said, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you got to go because I'm nominated for an award. And he said, I don't think I'm going to win. But if I do, I would like to be represented. I don't want to go. That was just, again, that goes back to that personality thing we discussed earlier. That was just not in Gene's wheelhouse, all this stuff. So uh, fortunately, I had a friend in the music business down in Nashville, Tim Neprestic. He was working for a, an artist named John Conley at the time. So I said, okay, I'll go. He said, well, think of something to say in case I win. I go. Now, I don't know anything about country music. This is 1985. And I'm sitting there, wherever the show was at, I can't remember the name of the venue. And my friend Tim saying, oh, over there, that's Mo Bandy, and over there, that's so-and-so. Hey, great, great, great. He said, Dave, I think we should go meet the Statler brothers beforehand, just in case you win. 
So we do, Jason. Now, again, I'm, I'm a mope, you know? So we go, we get backstage because we got credentials because I'm representing a songwriter. And we, we knock on the door, says Statler Brothers. We knock on the door. And I think the, the guy with the big bass voice was a guy named Harold Ballsy or something. And he opens the door and I, I say, huh? Hi, uh, I'm here representing Gene Pitney. And he just wanted me to say hi and thank you. And in case, in case he wins, he's thrilled you did it. And then I, he said, come on and meet the other guys. And then I said, listen. Listen, you guys, I have no idea what I'm doing here. If, if the song wins, would you please come on stage with me and just stand behind me? Just, just stand behind me. Sure, no problem. So now, Jason, I'm going to try to shorten this up. So now Roy Clark is the co MC, and there's a female singer whose name escapes me now. Beautiful, talented singer. So they read the nominees and Hello, Mary Lou by Gene Pitney, and they get the envelope. And the winner is Hello, Mary Lou, Gene Pitney. So I turned to Tim. I said, my friend, what do I do now? He said, you go up and accept the award. And I said, say what? Ah, just make up some stuff like timeless songs. Just go on and on and on. So this is the best part. Now, Roy Clark, bless his heart, he's now deceased. They announce overhead, accepting the award for Gene Pitney is Dave McGrath. Roy doesn't hear that. So now I walk up and to get to the microphone in the center of the stage, I have to walk behind the podium with Roy Clark and Lori, Lori Morgan. That's the singer, Lori Morgan. I have to walk behind Roy Clark and Lori Morgan. Now I'm walking up and he looks at me and I'm, I have to use a, as if I have to use a word that he didn't use. Uh, I can't think of the word I want. So I walk behind him, Jason, and he looks at me and says, he looks at Lori Morgan and says, who is this blankety blank? Because <laughs> he didn't recognize who I was. He knew Gene, and he knew I wasn't Gene. He forgot the, uh, he didn't hear the overhead announcement. Now, if that's not bad enough, now, now Roy Clark's called me a, a, a name. I get up there, Statler brothers come out, bless their hearts, each and every one of them, and I proceeded to introduce each one by the wrong name. I remember, <laughs> I had remembered the names, but I didn't get them correctly matched up. And then I was on the front page of the Nashville newspaper yesterday, the day after that, because of that, saying Dave McGrath, representing Gene Pitney, accidentally introduced each of the members of the Sadler brothers with their wrong name. Gene was so proud of me, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you look great. And again, congratulations for- you well, know, I was much thinner then and much better looking, wasn't I? <laughs> it was very, very neat. Um, so obviously with this book cutting out is going to re- and Gene Pitney was known worldwide. This is going to reignite the fan base. Are you still involved with that fan club or selling merchandise at all uh, as of today? When Gene died, his family asked us to disband the fan club. Okay. And so we did that. We're, we stay in touch with a lot of the fans. And I was a little surprised because when the book came out back in October, uh, Guida started to uh, flog it on Facebook, you know, social media, which is great. I was Because now most of his fans are baby boomers in their mid to late 70s. But I was surprised the reaction, how many of them are on Facebook mm-hmm. at that age. Maybe I'm naive and think they, they weren't on Facebook. But uh, a lot of them came on Facebook thrilled that something new about G. Pitney had come out. Because... The, nothing, there's no new material to release. There's no lost albums in, in the vaults. So this is actually the first new piece of material about Gene Pitney since he died in 2006. And so that fan base, loyal, uh, went out there and bought the book. We did, we're doing very well with it on Amazon.com. We do have a website if you want to read a little bit more about it called GenePitneyBook.com. But if you want to order it, just go to Amazon.com, type in Gene Pitney Book, and it pops up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was my last question. So to buy the, to purchase the book, go to amazon.com and the title of the book again. Title of the book is called Gene Pitney, the singer, the songs and the songwriters, 262 dynamite pages <laughs> of information about Gene and all his great hits. And the website again, genepitneybook.com. Well, Dave McGrath, it's just been an honor talking to you about Gene Pitney. It's a great book. Uh, you can go on my Amazon my account and check out the website as well. And Dave, thanks so much for talking to us today. Jason, always good seeing you. Better in person, but this was great. Thanks a lot.